Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Holy Saturday today. Everybody can hear me okay. And uh, just getting started here this morning for just a few minutes. And just wanted to come to you today. I'm Davis Taylor, um, longtime member at Good Shepherd and uh, part of staff. And just wanted to talk to you for just a minute. Let me make sure I got this going right. Think we're good? Okay. Believe we're good. <clears throat> All right. All right. Now, sorry. It's first time doing some things so we find ourselves today this is uh this is known as holy saturday um and for christians we we have history and and the faith to know us that sunday is coming and i think back to the disciples during their times and uh and what they had and while they had jesus we know that they still did not really understand that he was going to be coming back in three days, no matter how many times he told them, how many different ways he told them. And so, but they did have scripture. And so today I, I wanted to do a devotional this morning uh, based on some scripture that they would have had available to them. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite pieces, and it's uh, in Psalm 91. And so uh, just uh if you can sit back and enjoy and, and, and relax for a little bit and, and hear these words of hope. So before we get started, uh, I'd like to go in, into prayer for just a moment. And so, uh, Heavenly Father, we just uh, we come to you this, this Holy Saturday, Lord, in remembrance of the good gifts that you've done for us from the, the suffering of Holy Week, Thursday and Friday, for Jesus, for what you did for us, the sins you've taken upon you, our sins, the sins of the world. And Lord, we we yearn for the time we can gather again together, but we're also reminded that the church is not inside the walls. And we are thankful for these lessons that we are being reminded of. Uh, that we are to be in connection no matter where we're at, and to show your love and grace to this world. And that is being done by so much more right now than has ever been done before through uh, through our connections online. So, Lord, just uh, give us a few minutes here as we as we come together, and and thank you for your grace and your patience with us, Father. Uh, and Lord, thank you for the cross, and thank you that we know that Easter is coming, and that we serve a risen Savior. In Christ's name, Amen. So, <clears throat> I'm blessed to be able to sit outside. It's a little chilly this morning in White House, Tennessee. And a little windy as my papers all blow away. But I have my devotional on. But let me uh, start out. We're going to start out in Psalm 91. And I said this is, you know, this is scripture that um, well, the disciples would have had available to them. Uh, you know, they were not learned men by any stretch of the imagination for the most part. But they did have the teachings, and uh, and these were some of the same teachings that they had. So I'd, I'd like to think that in the midst of their anxiety and the fear that was going on and the persecution that was happening around them as they were waiting uh, and trying to figure out what to do next before Jesus came back to them, uh, before the realization that he was there with them. And so one of the scriptures in, in Psalm 91 it's really about hope. And I want to read it through and then we'll go through with the devotional. And so, um, it is, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty, I will say of the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. 
He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will, tramp in the great li- you will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. And so, a devotional that I've found that went along with this, and this was actually written by uh, a Jason Sorosky, and it kind of breaks down, especially the first few verses of Psalm 91. And uh, you have to excuse if you can hear my one of my kitties in the background here. She wants uh, wants attention as much as anyone else. Um, but let's go back to Psalm 91, verses one through two. Whoever dwells in the shadow of the most and the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. When life is draining and there seems to be no place to rest, these words are reassuring, comforting, and encouraging. When things appear to be their worst, I tend to get a bit negative. And most of us are like that. Our natural tendency is to go down and miss out on what God may be doing in our situation. When I find myself in these negative places, my goal becomes reprogramming my mind to fend off the negative and say of the Lord that He is my God in whom I trust, just as the writer of this psalm did. But there is also a deeper meaning in the passage, hidden in plain sight. In these first few verses, there are four names of God. The Most High, the Almighty, the Lord my God. Why does the writer use four different names in two verses and what is significant about it? Let's take a look at them. The first name, the Most High, is the Hebrew word Elohim. It suggests a supreme monarch who is elevated above all things. The name signifies God's majesty, sovereignty, and preeminence. It carries a connotation of a Davidic king that reigns above all other kings. And we see it first in scripture in Genesis 14, 18, describing Abraham's encounter with the priest king Melchizedek. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. Melchizedek gives us a picture of Christ in several ways, and it is fitting that this story contains the first use of his name of, of this name of God in scripture. Verse 1 speaks to the protection of one who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, and it causes us to ask, where is it that we dwell? Do we dwell in our own self-doubt? Do we dwell in anger? Do we dwell in what could be or what could have been? Or do we dwell in the shelter of the Most High God, the Holy King, who promises to protect us and keep us? And so the second name we see in these first couple of verses is the Almighty which is translated to Shaddai, uh, much like the uh, Amy Grant song, El Shaddai, right? If you're thinking of that right now, it's, you're not alone. Uh, Shaddai has many meanings, many meanings, but as you can imagine, it primarily suggests a mighty, mighty, powerful God who is strong beyond our imagination and is more than capable to supply every need. He is a God who parted the sea and controls all of creation. In his name and his power, there is no need that cannot be met and no circumstance that cannot be overcome. And so the third name is the Lord. It is the personal name for God revealed to Moses during the burning bush. 
the personal name for God who is considered so sacred in Judaism that the original pronunciation is uncertain, only that it contains the letter YHWH. It has been translated as Yahweh, Jehovah, and more often as the Lord in all capital letters. The significance of this name is that it represents a relatable God who seeks for us to know him on a deep personal level. The God who is all-powerful, divine ruler of all things, is the God who also knows every hair on our heads, every joy in our hearts, and desires us to know him intimately as friend. This God who created the universe and all it contains is not just some far-off unknowing being, but Father, Redeemer, and Friend. So I want to take just a second there. And let's really look back at that and review that. First, we have this God, name of God, that is the Most High. And looking at that, we know, being the God Most High, He is the Supreme Monarch. He is the Creator of all things. And then we have Shaddai, the Almighty. Not only is He the Creator of all things, but he is the most powerful and strong beyond all imagination. So we have this ruler that is the most high, the almighty, greater than all things, but then we also have the Lord who desires to know us. Now, I don't know about you. In my experience in life, there's not many kings or rulers that desire to know us as well as being overruling over us. Our God asks us to choose Him. He gives us free will to choose Him because He wants a personal relationship with us. And so, the last name, my God, comes from the Hebrew Elohim. And it first appears at the very beginning in the Bible in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When Elohim occurs in Scripture, it is typically translated as God in Greek. It is translated as Theos, which is where we get our word for theology. It means the one who is first, or creator, and is typically a plural word. So it is fitting that this is how God is referenced in Genesis 1-1, as a creator who is one, yet plural, Father, Son, and Spirit. The psalmist is proclaiming that the God in whom he trusts is the same God who created all things, the first and the last, and the God who is forever faithful to his creation. That's a whole lot of information in just a few verses, but it speaks to who God is to us, who God wants us to be to him, and the amazing grace and links that God is willing to go through for us. And so I want to read just a piece here on the end of Psalm 92, or Psalm 91, I'm sorry. And read this part again. Let me see before we get there. Can't tell. Getting here, hold on this a sec. Here on the end of Psalm 92, or Psalm. So, wanted to say hi to a few folks. Oops, my cat just jumped on the keyboard but uh hi Shelly Ruth Ann Betty good to see y'all and Ruth Huey good to see you all this morning um, and I hope you find this Easter to be incredibly awesome and uh, and wonderful as all because no matter if we cannot meet together uh, God is still with us and Jesus is still risen and our sins are still forgiven and that's a message that we need to proclaim to the world and uh, so thankful for uh, for the abilities to be able to do these things and share this message this morning. But to go back, um, just a reminder, and I, I think this is the key part of Psalm 91 here at the end, starting in, in verse 14. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. And I want to change the language a little bit here. And I want you to insert your own name where, where it says he or, or him, it can be uh, Davis or Shelley or Ruth or, or anyone else that's out there watching. Um, and let's make this a little personal. Because Davis loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue Davis. 
I will protect Davis, for he acknowledges my name. Davis will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with Davis in trouble. I will, be, I will deliver Davis and honor Davis. With long life, I will satisfy Davis and show Davis my salvation. Or let's take it another way. Because my church loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue them. I will protect my church, for they acknowledge my name. They will call on me, and I will answer them. I will be with my church in trouble. I will deliver my church and honor my church. With long life, I will satisfy and show them my salvation. So, folks... Just wanted to uh, just bring that message this morning. Know that no matter where you're at, uh, God does love you. He has a divine plan for you, divine providence for all of us. Uh, And he is in control of this situation today as much as he was in control of this situation a year ago. Um... Because his plans are not our plans, and his ways are not our ways. Uh, But he has given us free will to be able to choose him and to love him. And that's all he asks from us in return, is to love him and to share the gospel of his son uh, and the free gift that's been given to us. So as we uh, go through this Holy Saturday, I hope that you'll join us in the morning we have uh, our regular services scheduled uh, of course all online right now for Easter uh, sunrise service uh, at 6 30 a.m. will be live um, for those that want to get up that early and watch and we have uh, 8 45 and 11 o'clock tomorrow worship services you know and one of the interesting things a friend of mine said a little while ago was that while we could, she couldn't gather and couldn't go to her own church, um, she's been blessed by this in the fact that uh, she's able to see the church services of all the people in her life. Her her son-in-law is a, is a pastor, and so she's able to watch his, and then she's been watching our services and been watching some other services too during the week. And uh, to be able to, it, basically as her cup is, is over full right now with it, and I think that's, that's another thing God is doing through all of this, uh, is that the church is on message right now, like never before, and uh, and God is using all this in a powerful way. And so, uh, may you have a blessed and wonderful Saturday for the rest of it. Uh, enjoy this day, and know tomorrow as well as every day that Easter is here. We are Easter people and we serve a risen Savior. Amen. Have a great day.